terrific venue. I'm so glad that all of you were able to join us here. Um, uh, just happy that you can be with us for this great event. Before I get started, um, I want to thank a group of individuals um, whose expertise in and knowledge of our apartment industry made this event possible. And this group is our wonderful Optech Task Force and our Optech Supplier Advisor. So let me ask those two groups, individuals who are here, please stand if you wouldn't remain standing for a second. Julie, I know you're here, so stand up. Come on, all those who are on the committee. No, hold your applause, please. Hold your applause. Okay. I just want to uh, say thank you to these individuals for taking the time to make this uh, such a terrific uh, event. And let me give you one story to sort of cast a light on. Okay, Julie, you can sit down. Um, Tom Bazzuto, I think many of you know, is the chairman of NMHC for 2012 and 2013. And he and I talk every week. Every Wednesday morning, we, we, we talk and uh, share what's going on with NMHC and the industry. And he talks, he gives me his views and, and a lot of good advice. And I, so I was bragging about this conference at Tom and I said, um, just, just, just fantastic agenda and great speakers, great panels, just it's wonderful. He said, well, send me the agenda. So within about five minutes later, I got this note back with these exclamation points. Wow, this is a great, I wish I could come, dang. So uh, anyway, we're, we're very happy. So thanks again to all of you who helped plan this. I do want to say one other thing, though, that if you've got ideas, uh, we want to make this your conference as well. If you've got ideas for panels and speakers, please let us know. We will definitely listen to you uh, going forward. See, people are starting to come down to the front here. It worked. Um, be sure to stick around at the end of this general session uh, because our session sponsor has a special giveaway. And immediately following this session uh, is our opening reception, which you will not want to miss. Uh, the reception is sponsored by apartment, our friends at Apartment Guide, so thank you to them. I will thank them again. And I want to highlight all of our exhibitors. These are the companies that are the leaders in providing cutting edge products and services to our industry. They supported us during the tough years of 2008, 2009. They are people we deserve to give credit to and to pay attention to. So please stop by the booths, uh, see what they're doing, see the products and services they're working on. Tomorrow morning, uh, please join your colleagues for breakfast starting at 7 a.m. in the foyers outside of the morning roundtable sessions. We're gonna start those roundtables at 8 a.m. promptly. And now on to our, our first general session, which is sponsored by our friends at Verizon. I would like to introduce Phil Simon, a technology expert and author of a number of books, the latest being Age of the Platform, and we have books for each of you here. They'll be outside of this session hall after this event. Uh, in addition to authoring best-selling and award-winning books, Phil consults with companies on how to optimize their use of technology and speaks on emerging technology and innovation. I would like to add that we'll have Phil's presentation on our website after uh, this, so you don't need to scribble notes furiously during his presentation. I do want to encourage you to ask him questions. He enjoys very much the give and take uh, that, we, that he has after those sessions, so take advantage of that. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Phil Simon. Hello, my name is Phil Simon, and I'm going to talk today about platforms and innovations and planks and ecosystems. I'm going to have a lot of fun. We'll talk for about an hour, and then we'll do about 30 minutes of a Q&A, and then, if I'm not mistaken, there's an open bar. So it's either a really good thing or a really bad thing, because I'm the guy keeping you from drinking for free. But before we talk, I'd like everybody to stand up. You will not be standing for long. I want to try a little bit of an experiment. And what do we have, about 700 people here today? More than that, OK. Call it eight. Go ahead and take a seat if you use any product or service from Amazon. Kindle, Fire, Amazon.com, if you run your services for business, but Amazon Cloud Services, wow. About 70% of the people sat down, OK? Next up, Apple. If you're standing, go ahead and have a seat. iPod, iPad, iPhone. Anyone up? We go. <laughs> we got one. Are you on Facebook? 
sit down. <laughs> so I don't have to go to Google. Amazing. So ballpark 800 people here, and every one of them uses Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and or Google. The interesting thing, as I sat down working on the manuscript for this book about a year and a half ago, was that all of you use these products not because you have to, it's because you want to. And that's one of the key points that I want to make today. If you go back 15 years, when I first started working in sort of corporate IT, you used products from Microsoft and IBM, maybe SAP and Oracle. And you didn't use them because you wanted to. You used them because that's what you ran for your company. So there's something fundamentally different about these four companies. And that was riding through my head about a year and a half ago when I was working on the manuscript for this book. What is it about these four companies? And I stumbled upon a quote from Eric Schmidt on May 31st at the All Things D conference. And I'll just read it here. It seems to me that there are four companies that are exploiting platform strategies really well. And he named them Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And he called them the Gang of Four. And at the time, that was about 30,000 words into the manuscript. And when someone like Eric Schmidt, who at the time was CEO of Google, now he's the chairman of the board, basically validates the central thesis of your book, not a bad thing. So what is it about the Gang of Four? And more important, what can they teach every one of us? Because in the book, and you'll get a copy of it in a bit, I run two small businesses of one, single person LLCs. I've embraced some of the concepts of the age of the platform. So when people talk to me and say, yeah, but Google has billions of dollars and tens of thousands of employees, and Facebook has a market cap of $50 billion, we're just a 10-person company, we can't learn anything, I say, hooey. It's because of their platforms that these companies are so successful. And in fact, and I talk about this at the end of the book, and I'm sure we'll mention it today, it isn't just about the gang of four. Right? Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, WordPress, Force.com, all of these companies are building platforms. And in fact, they've ushered in this new age, the age of the platform. And that's what the book is about, that's what the talk is about. But I'm not big on buzzwords. I am very proud of the fact that in the four big, big books I've written, you will not find a single use of the word synergy. Uh, what does a platform really mean? Right? Everyone's talking about platforms. People are saying, yeah, Netflix is this wonderful platform. No. What can you build on top of Netflix? It doesn't mean Netflix is a bad company. Right? Show of hands, who's on Netflix here? OK, a decent number, probably 30 or 40%. But you can't build on top of it. I can't develop for Netflix. Now, there are reasons for that, right? Pri um, copyright laws. So what is it, what do we mean by platforms? Okay. I want to talk about little p versus big P. This notion of a technology platform, I would argue, has been with us for a long time. Operating systems like Windows 95 going back, right? Or even if you think telephone lines or cell phone towers. I'm not talking about technology platforms. Those are the little p's. I'm talking about the big P. And in this vein, the platform is a business model. It's a way of encouraging other companies and users to do something with your core products and services and take them in interesting directions. It isn't just the gang of four. Right? A lot of companies, we'll talk about Zynga a little bit later, they're basically b basing their entire businesses on top of existing platforms. Now that can be both good and bad, and a little bit later we're going to talk about these notions of coopetition and frenemies. And some of the talks I've had up to this conference and some of the talks today, people have talked to me about, yeah, well these guys are kind of the competition, we really don't want to work with them. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. A platform is nothing without its planks. So if you think physically, the more planks you have, the bigger your platform. And a plank to me is just a feature, an app, or a product, or a services. Um, so if you think about, say, Amazon, it started as an online bookstore. Well, some of you were standing up before, I'm sure, buy your books from Amazon, but it's not like you have to buy books on Amazon to be a part of its platform. Okay? You really want to incentivize others to do something for your company. Okay? And this gets into this notion of ecosystems, and that's a big part of what I'll talk about today. So as smart as Steve Jobs was, right, the initial 
version of the iPhone, which I think was released in 2007, didn't come with the App Store. That was a, a more recent addition to iTunes. So Jobs was a smart guy, but I'll bet you an awful lot of money that he didn't say, and once we release the App Store, Angry Birds will be downloaded 400 million times. Right? Just not going to happen. So part of the age of the platform is predicated on uncertainty, right? not knowing what's going to happen. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Right? One of my favorite quotes in the book is from Jerry Brown. And he was the former governor of California. And he said something along the lines of, everyone likes to plan because no one has to do anything. Right? So I don't buy into this notion that the, there are these intractable five-year plans. And this is exactly where we're going to be in, in 2017. I mean, who predicted the Arab Spring? Right? Came out of, out of nowhere, right? So platforms are based on planks, and they're really extended when you get into ecosystems, different users or communities taking apps in totally different directions. And I'm not exceptional, but I have an app in the App Store for my last book, The New Small. So with the tools and the incentives that we'll talk about in a little bit, it's never been easier. Now, I wish my app were downloaded 400 million times. So those are sort of the exceptions, but we've really seen the democratization of technology. The tools are available now, so you can launch. There's something like 600,000 different apps in the App Store. Android, I think, is over a million. So within that, there may be an opportunity for everybody here. But let's talk for a little bit more about Google. Because when 1998 came around, Google started as a search engine. Who remembers Google back in the day? Show hands. OK, so a decent number of people. Uh, I was drawn to Google immediately because in 1998 and before that, search was terrible. Right? You would type in search terms and you'd get back gobbledygook. It, it was very frustrating. Right? So Google comes along and they find out a better way to do search, but arguably more important, they figure out a way to monetize it. Right? Google isn't intrusive. The challenge that Facebook has today is that when you're on Facebook, you want to connect with your friends. You don't necessarily want to see an ad. But with Google and their entire model, this is why they've made so much money, you're searching for how to write a book. And oh, by the way, here's Lulu or iUniverse that actually is in the book facilitating business at the time of the purchase. So Google comes along, and they make search fundamentally better. But it was still a search engine. It wasn't a platform. I would argue that Google has become a platform. Okay. But why? Right? Why change? Right? Google has, to this day, makes roughly 90% of its profits and revenue from traditional index search. There's an entire line of thought states, ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? This is a true story. Take a guess. When did Kodak invent digital film? Anyone know? Take a guess. Nice guess. Uh, I believe it was 1975. So why did Kodak, a year ago, declare bankruptcy? Well, someone at Kodak said, hey, we can do digital film. And I guarantee someone higher up on the totem pole said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> That's going to cannibalize our business. Right? So it's about, in a way, taking an existing model that may be successful and realizing that that model may not sustain itself for the next two to five years. So that's why Google became a platform. Clayton Christensen writes a book about 12, 13 years ago. It's a business classic called The Innovator's Dilemma. And it gets to that point. And in the age of the platform, companies realize that they're going to be cannibalized. The only question is who's going to do it, particularly if you're a one plank company. Right? If you listen to management experts, say 20 years ago, Jack Welch, the head of General Electric, was famous for saying, we either want to be number one in our business or number two, or we're going to get out. And as a result, that the bar's kind of high there, right? Um, I don't think that that necessarily applies anymore. Um, one of my favorite quotes in the Steve Jobs book by Walter Isaacson is uh, Jobs saying, your business is going to be cannibalized. The only question is who's going to do it, you or your competition. So Google didn't want to become Microsoft. Microsoft is still a very valuable company, right? If you take its two core businesses, Windows and Office, those are both multi, multi-billion dollar businesses. Now, no one would say that that's inherently a bad thing, but in a way, Microsoft has been a victim of its own success. There was a fascinating CNET article about six, seven months ago 
about 19, mm, mm, no, it was about 2008, 2009, there were a couple of people in Microsoft working on a tablet. Now, I know Microsoft just released the Surface, but let's hold off on that for a minute. And the argument was, this will take us into the next generation. So it reached the highest level as a company, the Steve Ballmer level, he's the CEO. And the fundamental question was, how does this tablet benefit Windows and or Office? And the short answer, it doesn't. Project was scuttled. The two developers behind the project wound up leaving. Now Microsoft's trying to invent itself, but if I asked you 15 years ago who used Microsoft products, I guarantee you I wouldn't have had to go to the gang of four. Everyone in a professional capacity, for the most part, used Microsoft products. Again, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. There weren't really alternatives to Office and Windows, right? Mainstream ones, right? If you were a hardcore techie baby, that was a bit different. These days, you don't have to use Microsoft Office, right? You can use Google Docs, you can use Open Office, you can use a Mac set of tools, you can keep going. You don't have to use Microsoft Windows. You can use Mac OS X, you can use a form of Linux. You don't even need a PC. In fact, this is a fascinating statistic. It used to be that something like 95% of all devices that connected to the internet ran on Windows. Anyone take a guess how many devices as a percentage connect now on Windows? I heard 20. I heard 26. So think about it. Basically, more than 9 in 10 devices connecting to the internet 10 years ago. Now it's 1 in 4, and that number is dropping. So this is what was inside Larry and Sergey's head. If we keep doing just what we're doing, we are in a way making, us e making it easier for us to be ultimately disrupted. So Google did not want to become so successful that it wouldn't be able to survive or evolve. And that's why Google's making some of the moves that it's working. That's why it dropped $12.5 billion on Motorola when it's not a hardware company. That's why Google is now with Google Plus, this is its fourth bite at the apple with a social plank in its platform. Is Google ever going to become Facebook? I would argue no, but if I have to go off of Google to be social and connect with my friends, that's a bad thing, right? So anyone heard the term social search? Yeah. Right. True story. Around two years ago in change, I, I had it with my PC. It just, it was clunky, I knew how to fix it, but I got tired of fixing it. And I asked my friends on Facebook, I'm thinking of getting a Mac, but I haven't touched one since college. What do you think? And within two hours, 12 of my friends said, you're a geek, you'll love it. And they were right. Now, that was one fewer search that I didn't do on Google. I could have used Google, right? Pros and cons, right? Bought a book comparing Macs and PCs. But that was a search that Google couldn't do. And Google realizes that. In fact, the three, four months ago, Zuckerberg was speaking and he hinted that Facebook would launch a proper search engine. Now everyone knows on Facebook there's the bar you can search, but think about certain searches that I can do on Facebook that I no way could I do on Google. And Zuckerberg gave the example of which one of my friends in Manhattan has gone to a Chinese restaurant in six months. Google can't come close to that, and they know it. So they're trying to develop their platform and make their demise less imminent. So we know why Google became a platform. Let's talk about how. It added different planks. Gmail and Maps and Docs and Google Plus and Blogger, YouTube, Android. All of these things, 20 years ago, people would say, you're crazy. You're making a killing on index search. Why would you rock the boat? They understood that they needed to become a true platform. That's why they've made a lot of the moves that they make. And all of those moves haven't been successful. Right? Remember, if Google Wave and Orkut and Buzz had been social successes, we wouldn't be talking here about Google+. Plus. Right? Google's made a lot of mistakes, and in the book you're going to get later, I, I talk about some of those mistakes. But fundamentally, they're trying to let you do what you need to do on their platform. That new, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, my parents are there, they just had a, a power outage. And I often think about, uh, with the storm, if I had to only be on one platform, and I had to get work done. Let's say all the other websites were down and I could only use one. It'd be on Google, right? I can watch my movies, I can create simple documents, I can chat, I can do voice, hangouts, video. So all of these things weren't possible with Google 10, 12 years ago. So this is one example of this platform type of thinking. Okay. But what do these companies have in common? Okay. 
they frequently add planks to their platform. Again, when Jeff Bezos quit Amazon in, I'm sorry, quit his job as a hedge fund manager in 1994 to start Amazon, his initial goal was to build the world's biggest online bookstore because there wasn't one. And he did that. But once they sort of figured out how to sell books, he was looking for these uh, adjacent possibilities, these natural extensions. So if you can do books well, you can probably sell CDs and DVDs. So some of the products that they added, some of the planks to their platform, were actually very logical. But does anyone here use um, Amazon Cloud Services, Elastic Cloud? Okay, a couple hands. For those of you who don't know, around four years ago, someone at Amazon had a crazy thought. Amazon has these very expensive, very powerful data centers that are up 99.9% .9 of the time. In fact, if you can't use Netflix or Twitter, there's probably a problem with an Amazon data center. So the exception sort of proves the rule. Somebody at Amazon said, we, we have all this compute power, but we don't need it all. And it just sort of vanishes into the ether. What if we sold it? Right? Now, at a Microsoft type of company with that kind of mentality, we would have been laughed at, right? Well, does that help Windows? Does that help Office? No. But at Amazon, let's, let's play with it. And at first it was kind of clunky and the pricing model didn't make any sense. It was kind of like saying, how much electricity do you need? You can buy X number of, of watts or volts. Well, people didn't really respond to that. So they refined the model. And last year, Amazon actually, if you look at their earnings, doesn't break out how much they make from each area. They won't even tell you how many Kindles they've sold. Right? They keep that information private. But people estimate that Amazon last year made $850 million, essentially pure profit, from selling what it didn't need. And that number's supposed to go up to about $2.5 billion in 2014. Right? That's the kind of innovation that I'm talking about. In 2007, Apple Computer changed its name to Apple. Why? Well, it's just cleaner, right? Apple versus Apple Computer. And if you um, know about Facebook, it used to be called The Facebook. Right? They dropped that, it became just Facebook, it's cleaner. But forget that for a minute. Forget the marketing benefit of just being Apple. Apple was no longer primarily a computer company anymore. At that point, it had leached, uh, unleashed the iPod, iTunes, iPhone, soon to be becoming the iPad. So Apple no longer just made computers. It had become a platform company. So these companies frequently add different planks. These companies are all consumer-oriented more than business-oriented. There is this um, expression in IT called the consumerization of IT. In other words, going back 15 years ago, most of us, present company included, used the most powerful technologies at the time at work. And some of us may have had home computers, but they probably weren't as good. Nowadays, I'll bet you, most of you may have a more powerful computer on your hip than maybe the five-year-old PC still running XP. Okay. So we are constantly accessing technology. We are constantly consuming and generating data. Um, there's this rise of what they call the prosumer, basically the professional consumer. And you have all this choice. So these companies focus mostly on the end user. Steve Jobs was notorious for not wanting to sell to CIOs. Why? Because they ultimately weren't the end users of the product. right? And this is what Microsoft's trying to do, kind of day late, dollar short, with the Surface. Microsoft's major problem is that it has always been sort of an enterprise company. There's nothing wrong with that in the age of the enterprise. But now the consumers are driving everything. This is why Microsoft is trying to pivot, and it's easier said than done. So when I asked you before if you used Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, yes, you might use Google for work purposes, right? Or maybe you don't. But this is all about choice. Next up, these companies all use emerging technologies very well. Apple was the only company that needed to redefine itself because when the company was founded, I believe in late 1976, uh, the notion of cloud computing or grid computing existed, but it certainly wasn't as cheap or as common as it is today. No one talked about the cloud in 1976, so I'm told. These companies all get it. They use mobility, clouds. Uh, we'll talk later about application programming interfaces or APIs, software development kits, SDKs. They want to make it easy for consumers to use them and for developers to build on top of them. 
If you're a developer, the last thing you want to do is try to navigate some labyrinth of different data sets and rules and keys when you just want to get an app out there. Okay? And what else do they have in common? They use big data very well. Um, I'm very interested in big data. I'm, I'm currently writing a book about it. But if you go back to the enterprise, most people still think of data as what exists in a spreadsheet or a database table. Uh, that used to be the case. Now there's data everywhere. If anybody's tweeting here, that's data. This video, if it goes up online, that's data. Photos, right? call data records, web logs, all these different things are data. And they use this data really, really well. Uh, later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Target and some of the things they're doing with data that's actually really interesting. And there's one more thing that these companies have in common. Iconic leaders. If you think about Apple, it would always be Steve Jobs' company. Right? Uh, Zuckerberg is linked with Facebook forever. In fact, even though he doesn't own 57% of the company, he owns 57% of the voting shares. You can't get anything done in Facebook without Mark Zuckerberg signing off on it. And I'm exaggerating. You can do individual projects. You want people to innovate. But any big decision goes through Zuck. Larry and Sergey will forever be associated with Google. And I can't imagine Amazon without Jeff Bezos. And this is actually an important point. Because if you think about the struggles that some companies have had, I would argue that some of it stems from not having a leader with, not that they don't have skin in the game, but they didn't live it and breathe it. It wasn't in the uh, DNA. Yahoo has been a real um, interesting company to watch over the last four to five years. They've had something like six CEOs in six years. Now, if you're a CEO and you're taking over of Yahoo, odds are, right, Scott Thompson took over, I think it was about a year ago. He was the guy who lied on his resume, got bounced. You don't take over the fourth most visited site on the web and go, yeah, what the last person was doing was fine. Of course not, right? You go, well, this is what we were doing, particularly if that company wasn't doing well, and this is what we need to do now. So that company has bounced around left and right, and it's no wonder that even though it's still a very popular website, it just seems like it's not nearly as relevant as it was 10 years ago. So again, getting back to the innovator's dilemma about Google's paranoia about being disintermediated, you're better off being paranoid than being complacent. Now let's talk a little bit about how these companies have built their platforms. First up, and this is a critical point, there is no one right way. If you go back to 1995, 1996, I think that Amazon went public in, it was either late 97 or early 98, Jeff Bezos' mantra was get big fast. Okay? It's all about what they call first mover advantage. He understood that if you became the default place to buy books, and you could buy any book, then that's where you would go. Particularly if the prices were low, and they had great customer service, and now they're getting into even same-day shipping. So with Jeff Bezos and Amazon, it was all about getting really big, really fast. Okay? Some people will say that's the way you should do it. Not Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook was by no means the first social network. Okay? Uh, who remembers Friendster, or MySpace, Classmates.com, show of hands? I remember Friendster. It was a great idea in 2002. The problem was that it was always down. You saw the white screen. So I yelled, my friend's online. Not anymore. Well, he's actually is online, but I can't see him because the site couldn't handle it. So Zuckerberg, to his credit, understood that a platform had to focus on the user experience. In the case of a social network, it needs to be up. It could never go down. That's why, if you read David Kirkpatrick's book, The Facebook Effect, I think it's a great book. I, I liked it a lot more than the, the movie The Social Network. Zuckerberg understood that it was imperative for the site never to be down. There were schools clamoring. Remember, Facebook wasn't always open to everybody here. At first, you needed an EDU domain to basically say you went to college before they opened it up. And there were schools clamoring for Facebook. Right? Give us Facebook. We want Facebook. And he says, I know you want Facebook. We're not ready for you yet. Because he understood that if Facebook came with these really lofty expectations and it wound up not being very good, people aren't coming back. So the focus on Facebook 
has been on the user experience. And it, as you look at it now, they're having challenges now, they're a public company. It's interesting to see that kind of split. But for the most part, there is no run right way. One of the things of which I'm most proud in the book is that there isn't a, ta um, a checklist. I can't tell you if you do these five things, you'll be the next Google. Absolutely not. Okay. Platforms are sometimes open and sometimes closed. If you look at Apple, it tends to be a much more closed place. Facebook is kind of a wall garden. Facebook does not let Google index it. I can't Google Facebook, and that's by design, and that irritates Larry Page. He was on Charlie Rose a few months ago, and he was talking about how the internet should be open and free, and that may be true. But Facebook's whole value is that, you know, what happens on, you know, let's say what happens on Vegas. I live in Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas winds up on Facebook. It's important to know that there isn't a, it's more of a continuum, right, open versus closed. Amazon, I'm sorry, uh, Google was so open that Android became the wild, wild west. People were downloading apps. They didn't know if they would work or if it had a virus. There was no sort of quality control, right? Apple is more closed. Now, you can get an app in the app store, I know, because I've done it, but it's not like anyone can upload anything, okay? So think of this open-closed notion as more of a continuum versus a binary. And in fact, if you look at what Twitter's done recently, they've irritated a lot of the development community because they're now making it harder for developers to do different things. Twitter wants more of a standard look and feel to it. So there isn't an entirely um, set way of doing it. But if you look at these companies, scale, experimentation, and speed are key. And if you look at Twitter here, this is actually very instructive. Um, Twitter basically came about in 2008, and around 2009, late 2009, it started to blow up. And without getting all technical here, Twitter used to be based upon some open source sort of database management software. Its back end was something called Ruby on Rails. And it's free, anybody can download it and configure it. The problem, though, was that Ruby on Rails wasn't meant to handle 30 million tweets a day, okay? So the guys from Twitter had a decision to make. Do we want to sell out to Google or another company that wants to buy us because if we break, then we're not as valuable? Or are we in it for the long term? And if we're in it for the long term, then we need to blow up the back end. The guys from Twitter sat around and they decided we're in it for the long term. And they took away over the course of a number of months, Ruby on Rails, and replaced it with something more powerful, something that would scale, called Scala. The reason, I would argue, that Twitter is so important now is that it is, for the most part, very stable, and people are using it in interesting ways. So forget the presidential election, right? We don't have to talk about that. When the Seattle um, Packers game, <laughs> the, guy, the referee blows the call with the touchdown, that actually had 50, 53,000 tweets per minute versus, I think it was 50 for the uh, Romney-Obama debate. So we have to make sure that we can support uh, football. But all kidding aside, you have to have that scale. Because if your site goes down on a regular basis, people may not come back. Okay. Experimentation is absolutely essential. Adding these new planks. Again, I don't think that Google will become the next Facebook. But I give it credit for realizing that social search matters, social media matters, and if you pretend that it doesn't, then you can wind up going away. Okay. Next up, these platforms cross-pollinate. Right? So Twitter is a very useful communication mechanism. Google has its own official Twitter feed. Right? Amazon has its own YouTube channel. Right? So this gets into this notion of cooperation and, and frenemies. Right? Even though you may build a competing service, it's silly to ignore the fact that other services exist and people actually use them. Right? Now, platforms are all fine and dandy, and I, I would argue that they encourage innovation. Up until very recently, Google was very famous for the 20% rules. Essentially, engineers could spend one day a week on whatever they thought was interesting. And that led to some really interesting innovations, like Google News. However, when Larry Page took over in June of 2011, he realized that the company tended to be a little bit scattered. So Google has now sort of shut down products like Google Health and iGoogle. Uh, and they're trying to be a little bit more focused. But forget the internal emphasis for a minute. Think a little bit about the power of individual programmers, right? Of, of people out there who may have interesting ideas. Some people don't know this, but Twitter has been very good at integrating the input from others, or crowdsourcing, if you like. 
when Twitter was conceived, the guys didn't really know what they had created. So they were very open to suggestions like, oh, I don't know, the retweet button. Somebody said, hey, this is really neat. I'm basically copying and pasting. What if I could just hit a button? Bang, retweet button. Hashtags, again, user community. The at symbol to identify a user. Again, user invention. So they're looking to the ecosystems, the people outside, to see what they could be doing better. So if this notion of a platform isn't new, what's changed, right? Why is it different now? As I said, in the 1990s, there certainly were technology platforms. I spent a lot of that decade as an IT consultant before I started writing books and speaking. But they tended to be very limited, closed um, ecosystems, limited partnership. It was a big deal if you were a um, software consulting firm or a system integrator to have a partnership with Oracle or SAP or PeopleSoft. And the platforms weren't very open. So if I went from client A to client B, and at client A I developed this really neat report or database or extension or modified the code, it's not like you could have went to an app store, clicked a button, download it, and boom, it automatically works with your system. It just didn't work that way. Today, however, that's exactly what we're seeing. Okay, so the ecosystems are much more open, they're more vibrant, and we're seeing more collaborative partnerships, right? Apple can have as many relationships as it wants with different partners, right? You fill out the terms of service, you pay the money, if you don't violate it, you don't get in the doghouse, okay? So the scale today and the speed are so much different than they were. Even though platforms, I would argue, still existed back then, a lot of people didn't use them to the same extent that they did today. Okay. So external innovation is very important. In fact, these ecosystems are much better because people are out there doing different things on them. As I mentioned before, Angry Birds, who would have known, right, that it would have been so popular? There's just no way. It's less about, well, we didn't invent it here, right? And forget Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google a second. We're actually seeing traditionally stodgy industries open up. I used to work in pharmaceuticals, and you want to talk about not invented here. I joked, I worked for one company, they created their own, um, IT systems. To me, that never made sense. I never thought that somebody at IBM would say, we should really make our own aspirin. <laughs> right? That just didn't make sense to me. So what can other people do? Uh, this is why crowdsourcing to me is, is so interesting, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more later about Kickstarter. But there, there's a really interesting company called Kaggle, and it's sort of a combination of, of Kickstarter, which is this private funding platform, sort of a wiki type site and a social network. And we're seeing companies out there, I was looking at one recently, Merck, the big uh, pharmaceutical company, and they're trying to develop better drugs. And they've got all this data. And they're literally telling the crowd, anyone on the internet, we're trying to solve this problem. This is the data, this is what we're trying to do. Anyone got any ideas? And if you have ideas and we use those ideas, then there's something in it for you money-wise. So we're seeing that gradually even stodgy industries are opening up and they're saying, you might have a good idea or what do you think about it because you've got a different skill set. The great thing about a company like Kaggle, and I've been researching this for the new book, is that not only can you have an idea of the problem, you might not even know what you have. <laughs> you might have a bunch of data and you're saying, I'm sure someone can do something with this. Figure it out and there'll be something in it for you. So this isn't just about increasing your own um, R&D budget and looking inside your company. In many cases, it's about looking out there and seeing what kind of crazy ideas other people have. It is not just about the technology. It is about what you can do with the technology. When people say, oh, we, we have the cloud, it doesn't really do anything, a lot of CIOs don't see a cost savings when they jump into the cloud because they just add it. They don't replace anything. So if we're trying to involve the ecosystems, right, we want people to develop on top of our platform. We need a few things for that to happen, right? Anyone could raise their hand and say, we want developers to build apps, right? That's what RIM and HP are doing, right? Well, let's think about that for a second. There's a sort of network effect going on with the gang of four. People use them because other people use them, right? And network effects are not limited to Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. If you're the only person who sends email, it's not very valuable now, is it? Right? Whoever had the first fax machine or the first cell phone, not as valuable as when everybody has them. So there has to be this sort of critical mass for the platform to really explode. 
but fundamentally, you want to give the developers incentives. So in the case of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, we're really seeing this sort of 70-30 split. So I used to sell my app for $1.99 on, on the App Store. Now I thought it was a fair price. I've got interesting tips in this app. I spent a lot of money developing it. I might as well have charged $1,000. I had people offended. <laughs> How dare you charge $1.99? So I lowered the price to 99 cents, and now I'm even giving it away for free for a while. But if I sold an app for $1.99, then I would make $1.40 and Apple would make 60 cents. Now, as I said, I only wish that the app had been downloaded 400 million times, but there is an incentive for me to build on top of Apple's platform. And it isn't just Apple. If you look at what Google does with AdSense, so you can literally, if you've got a personal or company website, you can use AdSense and integrate it. And if someone searches your website and ultimately makes a purchase, you can get basically a, a part of that. Facebook does the thing with Facebook credits. If you want to buy virtual goods for SimCity or some of the other Facebook games, I'm not a huge gamer, then Facebook will give you 70% of that. They're making 30%. Think about it. To them, the risk is virtually zero. If you create an app and nobody buys it, it doesn't really take up any physical space. This is not a Target or a Barnes & Noble. Right? One of the biggest challenges for me as an author is trying to get a book into Barnes & Noble because there's only so much shelf space. Um, anyone read the Chris Anderson book, The Long Tail? Highly recommended if you haven't. In a digital world, there is unlimited shelf space. So Apple doesn't reach a limit because it embraces cloud computing, because it understands the importance of scale. It's not like Apple is going to break if it adds the 600,001 apps to the store. There really is no limit to how many apps can be in the store. And because it uses technology really well, like collaborative filtering and tags, it can help you search through hundreds of thousands of apps and more closely find the ones that you actually want. So 70-30 split. Uh, regardless of that number, you have to give people an incentive to innovate. Next up, incentives are fine, but you need to give people tools. And this gets into two things, APIs, application programming interfaces, basically um, technology that can connect two web services or two devices to each other. So a great example of an API actually comes from my third book. I work with a company called Chaotic Moon. They did web development. And they have an app resur resurrection program. So they were dealing with a company that created an app called FlightAware. And on iOS, it had a ton of one-star ratings. It was clunky, it didn't work, didn't have a lot of functionality, it was always crashing. They take the app, they break it down, they build it from scratch, and they use the Google Maps API. So now, if you're tracking the flight, FlightAware, you can see in real time where your flight is in Earth. Okay, so that is an example of an API. Uh, next up, software development kits or SDKs. It is amazing to me what some people are doing. I saw a TED video a couple of months ago about a 12-year-old who'd already created two apps. His parents paid the $99, he was registered with the App Store. So he creates this app and he said, yeah, that's what I wanna do for the rest of my life. Now, when you're 12, what do you really know? But the ideas that a 12-year-old would have, I, I can't even fathom because that person now has the tools. Or there was a nine-year-old kid in China who built an app. That's astonishing to me. Again, the downside to Apple is nothing. If the app isn't very good, right, let's say for a minute that it doesn't violate the terms of service, right? Apple doesn't want certain apps in there, right? If they're offensive, if there's obscenity or pornography or whatever. If the app just isn't any good, then nobody uses it. Again, this goes back to the point we made earlier. It's about choice. You don't really have to use any app. Right? I would bet you a lot of money that there are alternatives to just about any app in the App Store. So let's see some of these ecosystems in action, because this is where it gets really fun for me. Okay. Actually, before we do that, let's go back for a second to cooperation and frenemies. Some people say that that's crazy, right? You're potentially working with people who are trying to compete with you, right? In the newest version of iOS, for the uh, iPhone and for the iPad, there was very tight integration with Twitter and Facebook. Well, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm not entirely convinced that at some point Mark Zuckerberg decides that they need a phone. So in theory, you could be helping out others who could wind up turning around and hurting you. It was either Khrushchev or Brezhnev who said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in some cases, see these companies going, well, the ultimate threat is Google, right? If you're Apple. So why do you think for iOS 6, they took off Google Maps. Now, to their credit, Tim Cook said we screwed up, and they admitted that Apple Maps weren't as good yet, but it's, le it's more gray than it is black and white, right? If you were a pharma company 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't co collaborate with another pharma company. 
So we see this sort of natural tension among the different partners. Uh, and sometimes it's like kids in a sandbox, right? They're getting along, but someone throws some sand, the next thing you know, they're starting to fight. I want to talk for a minute about stock twits, because this is a great example. I, I'm very aware that platforms in here some tremendous benefits. But there's also the potential downside. Um, everyone's heard of the Twitter hashtag, right? Shift three on the computer, right, to tag something. Company um, StockTwits launched a while ago, and they created something called a cash tag. So it was dollar sign AAPL for Apple, or MSFF for uh, Microsoft, MSFT, excuse me. And if you clicked on the cash tag, you would get the financial information from StockTwits. Pretty cool, right? That's what the guys from Twitter thought. <laughs> they said, thank you, we're going to do that. And the CEO of StockTwits on his blog just went off, right? This is so unfair, how could you do this? You stole my idea, and I didn't disagree with him. But guess what, if Twitter didn't have an open API, we never would have heard of StockTwits. So this notion of cooperation and frenemies is really something to think about. Uh, it's not necessarily a clear yes or a clear no. Just understand that if you made your living off of one of these platforms and they changed the terms of service so they cut off the API, you really don't have any sort of recourse. Okay. Now, ecosystems in action. Anyone know who this is? Yes. No, it's not Scott Ian, but you're in the ballpark. This is uh, Jordan Rudess. And he's a very nice guy. He let me quote him in the book. He is the keyboardist of one of my favorite bands, Dream Theater. And I met him a bunch of times. I recently interviewed him from Huffington Post. He, he's a really nice guy, super talented. Went to the Juilliard School of Music when he was nine years old. He is a classically trained pianist, but he can basically play anything. So he's, for a long time, had a strong interest in digital music. And when the iPhone came along, I remember meeting him playing with it, and he was just sitting here like this. And I was backstage at a Dream Theater concert in Manhattan, having the time of my life. I was talking to his wife, going, you know, how's that going with him? He goes, she goes, I'll never forget it. We have this beautiful Steinway piano in our living room. <laughs> he just sits there all day playing with this. But here's the point. When Jordan is playing his instruments on stage in front of crowds, a lot bigger than this one, five, ten thousand 10,000 people, a lot of Dream Theater fans are musicians or aspiring musicians, so they're gonna go, oh, what is he playing? Oh, it's Sample Wiz or Morph Wiz or one of his apps. Guess what, I'm gonna buy it. So aside from being a very talented musician, he's also formed a company called Wisdom Music. So when he's out there playing for rabid Dream Theater fans like me, he's also marketing for Apple. Right? Because if you have the 30% rule, if you buy one of his apps for iOS, trust me, he spends a lot of money on them, a lot more than I did for my little app. So he's, again, making money for himself and for Apple. Okay. Next up, this is Amanda Hockey. She's, I think at the time of this picture, 20, maybe 25, 26 years old, and she's a self-published author, and she uses the Amazon platform. She creates these sort of Twilight Vampire teen eBooks. And over the course of four to five years, she developed quite the little tribe. She sold something like a million dollars worth of these Kindle books. So Amazon takes its cut, you know, 300,000 Amazon, pocket change, right? So she makes $700,000 for herself, and she did all of this without the help of a traditional publisher. She didn't need them. But guess what happened? Traditional publishers said, you can sell books. <laughs> we want to talk to you. And she had to think, how many people her age would love to be writers? How many people her age would have a bidding war erupt for her services? She ultimately signed a four-book, $2 million deal with St. Martin's Press. So she would not have had any kind of success in all likelihood if it weren't for Amazon, building on top of that platform. Now, she may be exceptional, right? There are anyone of you can easily create content and put it up on Amazon or an app in the eyes or an iTunes or Facebook game or whatever. But the, all of these things are possible. Next up, and this is arguably to me the most fascinating case. This is Mark Pincus. He is the CEO and founder of Zynga. 
And when it went public, the stock's been sort of hammered as of late, but it was valued at more than a billion dollars, and it was based on top of, of Facebook. Facebook spawned other billion dollar companies. That's astonishing to me. And this gets into this notion of frenemies and cooperation. At one point, Facebook was responsible for something like 95% of Zynga's revenue. So you want to talk about being reliant upon one company, almost uncomfortably so, there you go. But here's the other thing. Zynga used to be responsible, I haven't checked lately, for something like 15 to 20% of Facebook's revenue. So almost have sort of a mutually assured destruction type of thing going on. Now, Zynga's been hammered lately, and it's definitely not worth a billion dollars now. Stock, I think, is down to $2.60 last time I checked. But think about it. You have a company that spawned another billion-dollar company. Um, anyone ever heard of Kickstarter? Okay. For those of you who haven't, Kickstarter, I think, is one of the five coolest companies around. Anyone could launch any kind of project and get funding. So think about not knowing if your product's going to sell and it could be a physical product. I've actually run two of my books through Kickstarter. Um, there was a great example of a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, watches are sort of falling out of fashion now. A lot of people don't wear watches anymore because they got cell phones. And I guarantee you that if you had wanted to start a watch company in which you would be developing apps for watches, most VCs would have said, you're insane. No one buys watches anymore. OK. No. The founders behind this Pebble watch said, let's take it to Kickstarter, and we want to raise $100,000. And our vision is that you can have a watch with apps on it. Anyone know how much money Pebble watch raised? They had to stop at $10 million. Okay. Now, if you were a VC and you knew in advance that <laughs> you had to stop at $10 million, you probably would have written this guy a check. Right? So Kickstarter, to me, is almost a meta platform, in other words, a platform that can launch other platforms. I talked before about how Twitter has had some challenges with sort of offending the community. Right? The developers aren't happy because their access is being restricted. Plus, a lot of people are starting to get annoyed that you can advertise on Twitter now and you have promoted tweets. Well, there was a guy by the name of Dalton Caldwell who launched a Kickstarter project called App.net. He said, for $50, you pay that per year, and this will be the most developmental a developer-friendly platform ever. We will not put any restrictions on developers, and there will be no advertising. Okay? So he was developing an alternative, and he actually met his goal on Kickstarter. But that's a real challenge, because if Facebook had charged $50 a year to join, I don't think we would have heard of Facebook. So did or Twitter. So we're seeing a lot of these platforms evolve. If you're launching a Pebble watch, or if you're Kickstarter, the genius of Kickstarter is that there's basically no risk, right, if you're the inventor or the, the author or the musician. Funny story about Kickstarter and getting back to Amazon. The way Kickstarter makes money is that they take 5%. So if, with the um, Pebble Watch example, how's my math? They made $500,000. Most people aren't going to give Kickstarter their credit card information, right? For those of you who used Amazon, I'll bet you a lot of money that Amazon has your credit card information on the file. So Amazon gets 5% just through processing everything through its billing system. Why? Because people trust Amazon. So Amazon made another $500,000 just for letting Kickstarter use its billing system. Again, that's not something that a bookstore normally does. So it's that type of thinking. It's almost like you're embracing the crazy, and if it doesn't work out, then so be it. In the book, I argue that almost always the costs of inaction exceed the cost of action. The cost, everyone's talking now about failing fast. I think that's the best way to do it, right? Uh, Thomas Edison said, I didn't invent the light bulb. I invented 999 ways not to do it. So for people who are looking for absolute certainty that a website or an app or some kind of new technology is going to pay off before they do anything, I say keep looking. Nobody knows, right? You can only increase your probabilities of success. I, I don't think that you can guarantee anything. So what are the implications of all this for the apartment industry uh, before we, we take some questions here? Um, there's this continu continuous evolution. I, I don't think now, based on my understanding of this industry or really any others, that right now it'll be the same as it is five years from now. So things are always going to evolve. Um, I don't know if there'll be sort of fallout from the Gang of Four. 
couple months ago, I would have said if anyone would fall, it might be Facebook. Now, if you look at Apple stock recently, it's kind of getting hammered. USA Today, actually, uh, when I was uh, having breakfast this morning, had an article about Apple's days possibly being numbered. So there's no guarantee. Um, I would say, though, that if you're trying to bet on a platform, um, you want something that has a reasonable chance of being around. So something like Salesforce.com, again, I can't predict the future, but given how that company's gone, I'd be shocked if it's not around in five years. Next up, cooperation is here to say. Um, I really think that in some cases, there'll be a need to work with people who could potentially harm you. Now, hopefully, they have incentives not to harm you, incentives to actually work together. But if you're only looking at potential partnerships based on someone not potentially causing you some trouble down the road, I think that you'll keep looking. Um, I think that we're seeing increasingly temporary alliances among some of these companies. Who's to say that if Facebook starts doing some things that Apple doesn't like, that the next version of iOS doesn't have the same tight Facebook integration? Embrace data. Now, earlier on, I talked a little bit about Target. And I'm going to sort of challenge the audience here and hopefully not tick a few people off. Um, not everybody enjoys thinking about data. A lot of people like to make decisions based on gut feel. Right? I know what I know because I know it. Now, my understanding is that the retention rate in the apartment industry is about 60%, so of every five renters, three will re-up. And that might be a hard number to move, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible. So what if we did something with data? I want to tell a little story here. Um, I'm actually putting it in the new book. Um, but has anyone heard of what Target was able to do in predicting teen uh, pregnancy? Okay, it's a fascinating story. Um, so in 2002, a statistician by the name of his name is Andrew Pohl, starts working at Target. And now he's, I think, right out of school, a few years of experience. And a couple guys from marketing go up to him and say, can you possibly predict which of our customers are pregnant? And he said, I'm a statistician. Give me what you got. So he culled through the data, and he found that if women were purchasing certain types of lotions, certain types of vitamins, they were actually likely to be pregnant, right? Now, some of it was a little fuzzy, because if you're nine months pregnant and about to give birth, you're probably buying baby food, maybe diapers. But if you're three months pregnant, you're probably not buying diapers and baby food for six months, right? So it definitely wasn't 100%, but this guy, Paul, developed a pregnancy prediction model. So after he gave the data to the marketing folks, they did what marketers do, and they generated different flyers and they sent them out. So one day, a guy in Minneapolis storms into a Target demanding to speak to the manager. And he's waving this flyer. He's going, you sent this to my 18-year-old daughter. How dare you? Right? She's as pure as a driven snow. Right? He's screaming at her. And the manager goes, you know, sir, I'm sorry. I obviously don't work in marketing. I'm just a store manager. You know, what can we do to keep your business? So he leaves the store. A couple days later, the Target manager calls back. You probably see where I'm going with this and says, you know, sir, I just want to make sure that you're not still angry with us, right, blah, blah, blah. The father of the girl says, I owe you an apology. It turns out that there was some stuff going on in my house that I wasn't aware of. So Target, based on its data, was able to know that a 17, 18-year-old girl was pregnant when her own father wasn't. So getting back to big data here, I don't want to hear that there's just no way that we can quantify this, right? I, I don't buy it. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm working on the new book. There have to be ways to look at all sorts of information out there that won't necessarily move a retention rate up from 60% to 100%. That's just not possible, right? People move, people switch jobs, right? There are apartments. They're a lot easier to get out of than, than leases with, with um, mortgages with house. But there have to be ways to use information in sometimes counterintuitive ways. Next up, um, you really do want to incentivize others to build on top of your platforms. It's much more about the culture than it is about the technology. Right? There's a, one of my favorite management sayings is, culture eats strategy for lunch. Right? So we've got the cloud. We've got a best of breed CRM, customer relationship management system. Right? We've got an app. That's great. What do you do with it? Right? It is very tough to get people to change some of their ways. I've done speaking gigs over the past year for some interesting organizations, libraries and the post office. 
they face some challenges. Even if the technology is there, will people actually use these technologies? Okay. So this is me, and I would love to answer as many questions as you have. Or am I just competing with an open bar? <laughs> Hit me, challenge me, disagree with me, agree with me. Yeah, is there a microphone? I, I think we got a runner here, uh, Carrie. Phil, the um, companies like Google have been great at with web developers giving out what I call big data. I can go and I can grab data and I can throw it on a map. And they've spawned businesses in the apartment industry with mm -hmm. search sites. But I've also found lately that they're starting to lock down the data where, well, you can have data for your map as long as you don't hit it more than 20,000 times a day. Okay. So they're kind of starting to limit down big enterprise but from getting their data. And I just wanted to get your view on how do you see the flow of data out of these platforms if they're willing to, if, if you think they're going to be locking down data more and charging for that data? Sure. There's a school of thought called Infonomics that I've been researching for the new book. Basically, it says that information is an asset and that asset should be quantified and protected. In fact, that information ought to be on a balance sheet, kind of like your liabilities or your receivables. These platforms spawn in a tremendous amount of data. And, and you're right, they, they lock it down. Um, one of the cool things about Kickstarter, and I've used this from personal experience, is that I can know exactly who wants to buy a book. Okay? I don't know on Amazon who buys my books. And some people say, well, wouldn't you like to know that? I say, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to start my own bookstore, but imagine if I could let these people know that I have a new book coming out. Amazon protects that data. I don't disagree with what they're doing at all. I would do the same thing because that is a tremendous asset. In some cases with Google, if you look at their history, they've rolled out a product like, say, Google Plus. They rolled it out there. It's okay, you know, this is in a limited beta. Maybe it's in a full beta and then it's generally released. Google then started building APIs on top of it, but they'll do it sort of in a little, little bit at a time because they don't know what the response will be. So Google is still sort of experimenting, uh, but Google is also developing products that may help companies interpret this data. Um, I had mentioned before, um, I think it was over, over lunch, um, Information Week just had an interesting story on Sears, right? Now, Sears is the very definition of an old school organization. Who here has been to a Sears in the last six months? Okay, not a lot of hands. If I asked that question 30 years ago, I bet you most people would have raised their hands. So not only is Sears trying to compete with uh, Walmarts and Targets, and baby predicting statisticians, Sears has to compete with Amazon. And Amazon competes on price pretty well. Jeff Bezos has routinely said, I don't care about profits. And he's really irritated his investors. If you look at Amazon's operating margins, they're razor thin. In fact, on the Kindle Fire, estimates say that it costs about $249 to make, and they're selling it for $99. I'm sorry, for $199, excuse me. So Amazon is taking a loss. And it's the notion of a loss leader is not only Amazon's. I think it was, was it Gillette? Said we'll give them the, um, the, raz uh, the, bla uh, the razors, we'll sell them the blades. So that isn't new, but yeah, data is a tremendous asset. And if you think about, I mean, why is Facebook valuable? They don't sell anything tangible. It's because if you're a marketer and you can identify um, people 35 to 45 in Las Vegas who like technology and listen to Dream Theater, I'm the guy. If you take away that information, then I would argue Facebook has very little value. Other questions? Uh, Phil? Hi. Back here. Right side, there you go. Um, you were mentioning that USA Today article where someone was talking about the end of Apple. Um, I can sort of understand a platform that maybe isn't really well liked being displaced, but considering how much Apple is liked and you know the cultish following they have, what are the steps for displacing a platform as large as someone like Apple? <laughs> oh, gosh. That's an interesting question. Apple, I would argue, though, isn't as well-liked as you may think. Uh, it's funny. Um, Facebook, when I researched the book, I want to say it was on a Business Insider list as the ninth most hated company. 
Um, go plenty of people hate Google. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily our steps. Uh, one of the books that I mentioned in the age of the platform is The Halo Effect by Phil, Hor I think it's Horowitz. But he talks about, in, in his words, the, the folly of books like uh, Good to Great or Tom Peters' In Search of Excellence. Because if you look at those companies and say, what can we learn from them, then you're sort of neglecting other companies. Right? What if you do everything right and you're Apple, and then something else comes along that you didn't possibly see? Uh, this is why, like I said, I'm most proud of the fact that I'm not saying if you, in the book you do these 10 things and you will never be displaced. This is why Google is, I wouldn't say blowing up, but trying to figure out what happens when index searches become less relevant. If you had said a year ago, who's going to challenge Apple? I don't know if you would have had a clear answer. These days, forget the rest of the gang of four and Microsoft with the Surface, but Samsung has been gaining a lot of tablet market share. And in some, and I'm not a patent attorney, but if you follow the lawsuits like I do, it actually is very interesting. I don't know if they're necessarily our steps. I would argue that the, um, if you do make a mistake, and let's face it, Apple's made mistakes. There was MapGate, there was AntennaGate. Um, a couple of uh, months ago, they pulled out of PETA with something like the Project for Environmental something something or other, and basically tried to enforce environmentally friendly manufacturing standards. Tim Cook had said, yeah, are, are bad. So if you move quickly and admit mistakes and build a product that people like, then I'd argue your chances are lower. But I, I can't say, as long as Apple doesn't do these five things, Apple will still be relevant. It's hard for me to imagine Apple not continuing to do well. If you look at its PDE, it's something like 14. They have $120 billion in cash, which last time I checked is more than the federal government has. Kind of scary. At one point, Apple could have bought Greece. <laughs> They're big. Um, but because of that, we're seeing a lot of the imitation. And again, I'm not a patent attorney, but if you're Samsung, I I've seen the, the Samsung phones. They look incredibly, I've, I've used them. Hey, can you take a picture of us? I've never seen this before, but I kind of figured it out. So the short answer is I don't know if there is such a list. Um, I can say, though, that by not being complacent and being on the side of paranoid, um, they're going to do very well. Other questions? Yeah. Phil, um, whoa. Hello, it's time for cocktails, I think. Um, you mentioned, you had a slide earlier where you showed the old, or you called the 1990 software vendors and the walled garden and then the open kind of ecosystem. If you're in an industry that is still kind of in that 1990s walled garden mo mode, can you give any advice to the industry on how to try to move to that open ecosystem world? Okay. As I said, culture eats technology for lunch. If people are looking for a guarantee that a new investment or an app or a website or something is definitely going to pay off, then I think you can keep looking. I will say this though, from what I understand, Olivia, I mean, how many people rent apartments in this country? It's a big number, right? How many companies service those people? Another big number, right? Someone is going to try something and it's going to succeed. Right? And there will always be the old guard who says, look, I, I don't need any sort of change. And look, some of the industry may be able to escape relatively unscathed. My, my father uh, has owned commercial real estate for all of my life. Um, he's not the most computer savvy guy. But he's limited right, of what he can do. And, and he's fine with that. So I can't say that a five person outfit that manages a relatively small number needs to change. But if you want to survive and perhaps grow, I mean, to me, if, if I, let's say I had four buildings with 2,500 renters in each one, if I could move the needle 2% from 60 to 62% retention, that would result in something in my bottom line, right? And what if I could do even better than that? Um, it's tough, though, because so many people go, well, this isn't the way we do it, right? Talking to people from libraries and post offs, I, I get a lot of, this is the way we always do it. I think that understanding that the tech, it's not like the internet's a fad, right? It's not like in two years people will say, oh, what were we thinking with mobility? If anything, things are going to keep going. So in my opinion, you could either follow, lead, or get out of the way. Um, but I would be paranoid that if I didn't make some changes, whether or not I was leaving money on the table. Because someone out there is probably saying 
maybe Simon's not a complete crackpot. Maybe we ought to be taking advantage of some of these things. And once they start to do it, for example, if you want to start a social network now, good luck. A couple of um, months ago, Microsoft announced uh, so.cl, their its own social network. I don't think it was a full-blown attempt, but really, isn't there sort of a social media fatigue right now?